as we move on um, to this related story, the anti-Hamas bill that passed in the House yesterday was heavily supported by APEC, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee. In fact, one of the critics of the bill, Congresswoman Betty McCollum of Minnesota, who the ambassador referred to, accused APEC of threatening her because she voted against the bill. She said an APEC activist called her office to say her, quote, support for terrorists will not be tolerated. Well, we turn now to look at this recent study that's caused an uproar in the academic community and in the media. The study is called The Israel Lobby in U.S. Foreign Policy. The authors of the paper are Professor Stephen Walt of Harvard University and John Mearsheimer of the University of Chicago. They charge that the United States has willingly set aside its own security and that of many of its allies in order to advance the interests of Israel. In addition, the study accuses the pro-Israel lobby, particularly AIPAC, of manipulating the U.S. media, policing academia, and silencing critics of Israel by labeling them anti-Semitic. Well, a new article in the New York Review of Books examines the controversial report and the reaction to it. It's called The Storm Over the Israel Lobby. It was written by media critic Michael Massing, who joins us now in our Firehouse Studio. Michael's a contributing editor of the Columbia Journalism Review and frequently writes for the New York Review of Books. We welcome you to Democracy Good Now. Good Why don't you summarize the paper and the response? Well, the paper by the two professors, uh, it's a very uh, strongly argued uh, case that um, U.S. foreign policy has been sort of taken into a uh, uh, counterproductive direction by the power of the Israel lobby. And they define the Israel lobby in very broad terms. They, they include not only groups like AIPAC, but uh, Christian Zionists, neoconservatives, um, media monitor groups uh, from a pro-Israel perspective, and so on. And people like, uh, well, the former House Speaker, Tom, De the, uh, the majority with Ma Tom DeLay. Tom House DeLay and, and other people uh, like that, Dick Army, and so on and so forth. And they sort of put them all together. It's one thing that became controversial. Are, all, are, are Christian Zionists, for instance, part of the Israel lobby, or is that yet another type of pressure group, and so on? Uh, but they basically argue that uh, from a strategic and moral standpoint, the U.S. really, it's not in, in uh, America's interest to be backing Israel as uh, strongly and unwaveringly as it does. And the re main reason that Israel does back, uh, that the U.S. does back Israel is because of the power of this lobby. And they, they attempt to show that, that not only has it sort of uh, uh, skewed U.S. policy on Israeli-Palestinian relations, but has affected U.S. policy on, on many other regional issues, particularly uh, the war in Iraq. Uh, they claim that the uh, U.S. would not have gone to uh, war against Iraq had it not been for uh, the threat that Iraq posed to Israel and had it not been for the support for Israel in this country uh, through the Israel lobby. And the reaction, you know, was was just tumultuous. Um, Before we get to the yes. reaction, explain who these authors are of this piece, and which makes it so significant. Right. Well, the senior person is John Mearsheimer, who is a uh, professor of international relations, international security at the University of Chicago, and his colleague Stephen Walt, who is at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and has been the uh, administrative dean there for the last three years. So these are two very eminent professors. Uh, more so, they're, they're sort of rather, uh, I don't know, they're, they're realists, basically. They are, come out of the sort of Brzezinski uh, School of uh, International Relations, that uh, international uh, policy should be based on national interest, and they are writing from the perspective that U.S. policy in the Mideast, particularly U.S. support for Israel to the extent it's been, has not been in the U.S. interest. So very impeccable establishment credentials, which is one reason why their taking such a strong position created such a stir. And the piece went up on the Harvard University website. Well, it's interesting. It originally was commissioned by the Atlantic Monthly, and they wrote it for the Atlantic, but the Atlantic ultimately rejected the piece and uh, it made its way circuitously to the London Review of Books, which said, we want this, we want you to have even more about the Israel lobby in it. And so the piece uh, appeared there in March and simultaneously went up on the website of the Kennedy School. And the Harvard Connection has added an element. It, it, it has brought much more attention just because of the, the Harvard brand name. The response in the media. Well, the response, I mean, the response the media is part of the response, but in general, uh, many, many people have attacked this with a venom that has been extraordinary. Actually, the New York Sun has been in the lead. Uh, they ran several front page articles uh, of a really extraordinary nature. I mean, 
One of them, their lead story one day in March was about how David Duke endorsed this paper and claimed that it vindicated what he's been saying all along about U.S. policy, that sort of Israel was behind the war in Iraq and so on and so forth. They claimed, based on Alan Dershowitz's uh, assertions, that, that Mearsheimer and Walt, the two professors, got some of their information from neo-Nazi websites. That became a front-page article in the New York Sun. I mean, I was actually surprised the New York Sun went as far as it did. These articles were so unbalanced, um, even for a conservative newspaper like the Sun. Alan Dershowitz uh, got the Kennedy School to post his own rebuttal, 40-some pages long, in which he attacked various parts of, of the paper. And l let me say that the paper itself made a lot of strong arguments about Israel and its history that struck many people, even supporters of their general argument, uh, as, as one-sided and harsh. They went into a whole history of, of Israel's crimes, as they call them, against the Palestinians without really talking about the violence that has come from the Palestinian side against, the, uh, against Israel. So as I argued in my own paper, they sort of invited some of the criticism that they got. Aretz is taking this very seriously. Some interesting discussion in the Israeli newspaper. Well, you know, uh, Amy, the, it's long been considered that the Israeli press has a, a more vigorous debate about sort of relations with the Palestinians than you can have here, in part, uh, I think, because of pressure from from the lobby. But Haaretz, for instance, uh, said that, um, you know, whatever one thinks of the merits of the paper, the storm it's kicked up, the issues it's raised, the fact that two professors like this of such uh, credentials have raised these issues should be taken as a warning sign about uh, sort of the limits of American tolerance for Israel's policies in occupied territories. We're talking to Michael Massing, contributing editor at Columbia Journalism Review, board member of the Committee to Protect Journalists, has written the piece, The Storm Over the Israel Lobby. Noam Chomsky has also critiqued this. From right. Uh, from, from the left, uh, some people, uh, Chomsky and others, feel that it basically uh, takes an ennobling view of America and what its interests in the world are, that, that America, had, a, if it were not for the power of the Israel lobby, uh, would conduct itself in a much more sort of Wilsonian way, when in fact, Chomsky argues, if you look at U.S. policy around the world, um, the type of, um, that Israel has in fact served U.S. interests very well, uh, smashing Arab nationalism, protecting U.S. access to, uh, to oil and other natural resources, and that Israel has helped U.S. policy in places like Central America in providing sort of military assistance to some of the regimes the U.S. propped up there in the 1980s. Uh, we just have a minute, so your summary now of where the debate goes uh, and how significant this is. Uh, despite the debate, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of tension to this in the U.S. media. Right. I mean, for instance, the New York Times uh, ran an op-ed piece by Tony Judd, which was very, very strongly backing uh, the professors. But beyond that, their news coverage has been very minimal. Uh, Washington Post, if you look at the uh, sort of main outpost of, of our top media, uh, it's been very um, uh, scant coverage. And to some people, that's an indication that uh, the truth that it is hard, in fact, to debate these issues because of, of the pressure on the press. Finally, uh, you were at the APEC meeting, the big I didn't go. Oh, I, didn't. I, Just I sort of tried to reconstruct it based on interviews. In March, um, where, in fact, the bill we just had debated uh, is, was a major topic. But the power you see um, of APEC in determining policy. I think it's very strong. I think that, uh, as I quoted, what I tried to do in my article is do some of the reporting that I thought the paper itself lacked on the actual power of APAC. How, how strong is it? And, and I found that, in fact, it's very strong, particularly in Congress. They create what one former Clinton official told me was background noise that, like right now, in terms of the administration, what B you showed President Bush's comments, that's all made against the background of this tremendous operation that APAC has where they can take hundreds of activists to Congress and meet, put pressure on congressmen. Uh, if they do not go the way they do, as, as Betty McCollum found out, uh, the congressman from congresswoman from Minnesota, they can they can uh, you know brand you this way and that way. The local press will pick it up, and also the money factor is very strong. APAC um, helps to guide people, not both PACs as well as uh, individuals in terms of their money giving. The fundraising aspect is very big. All which means that APAC is is not. Um, indomitable, but it has a very strong influence in creating the context in which U.S. policy toward Israel Among gets the most made. powerful lobbies next to the NRA. Yeah, it's up there with the NRA and uh, AARP. 
I want to thank you very much for being with us. Michael Massing, contributing editor of Columbia Journalism Review, board member of the Committee to Protect Journalists. His piece, The Storm Over the Israel Lobby, appears in uh, the current issue of the New York Review of Books. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. We'll be back in a minute.